Hello, and thank you for joining us on the latest episode of Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. My name is Andrew Dunkley. I am your host, and it is great to have your company once again. Coming up on this episode, it's a jam-packed episode. Uh, a coronal mass ejection has destroyed a bunch of Starlink satellites, and uh, yeah, that's um, been a bit of bad news. Uh, we'll talk about that and why it happened, and a rocket body is about to hit the moon. Uh, and uh, it's not got anything to do with Starlink, so uh, completely different uh, scenario there. Uh, but uh, on the good news front, the James Webb Space Telescope has snapped its first image, uh, and it wasn't a selfie, although I think it's done that too. And uh, a third Earth-like planet has been found orbiting Proxima Centauri. We will also tackle some audience questions uh, about hitching a ride on a passing object to help us get where we want to go to save fuel. I like the idea. Uh, Ralph's having trouble with his telescope. You should never have pulled it apart, Ralph. I'm telling you right now. And Peter uh, wondered what we would go back in time to witness some kind of astronomical event. If we could make a choice of one, what would it be? So uh, that's a great what if type of question. Love what if questions. That's all coming up on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, nine, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. Five, four, three, two, four, three, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me as always is the great man himself, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I am quite well, feeling uh, very re refreshed after a, a little trip. Judy and I did a, a little journey down to Melbourne. Uh, we saw a bit of cricket. We went to Brighton Beach, walked to St Kilda. Uh, saw the, the ladies' cricket, the international between Australia and, uh, and England. Then we went to Hobart and uh, did a bit of sightseeing there. Went to a, a gallery, which you can get to by ferry. And this was a really strange ferry, Fred. Um, the seats were sheep. Oh, <laughs> The seats were sheep. I, I did feel a bit sheepish <laughs> taking such a seat. Of course. Um, there was an expensive section of the boat for other people. We didn't have the money for that, but I wouldn't sit on the um, on the sheep because I felt sheepish about doing that. And I found out why they put the sheep on the ferry. It was so that they could achieve ramming speed. Oh gosh! Sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to pull the wool over your eyes, Fred. Uh, yeah, uh, and and I also found wrong. out that uh, they are merino sheep. Okay, there Get you it? go. Yeah, Marino, I do, Marino. Yeah, 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 yeah. You bet. Any, any more? Any more? <laughs> you, you bet there are. Oh, bet there are too. Yeah, you yeah, got to think about it. Uh, how are you, Fred? By the way, uh, oh, fine, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, on a night schedule at the moment because I'm attending yeah, a. You, you were at a conference, virtual conference last night. I was, and we'll be at it again tonight. This is um, a a meeting of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which I've been attending as one of Australia's delegates. Um, wow, I did a presentation. Big stuff. It is. It's grown up stuff. Is that? I did a presentation last <laughs> night on the, on our efforts in keeping our skies dark and quiet. Yeah, which is very difficult to do. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it is at the moment. It is at the moment. Yeah, but it's mm. all right. We're 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 working on it. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, speaking of which, um, we have heard in the recent news of a coronal mass ejection that has uh, destroyed a bunch of Starlink satellites. Uh, what exactly happened? Yeah, this was at the beginning of February, I think. The Yes, Thursday, the 3rd of February at 1.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the US, Falcon 9 launched 49 satellites to low Earth orbit. Um, but Unfortunately, uh, there was a geomagnetic storm the following day. Uh, and you, you will remember, Andrew, that the Starlink satellites, when they're launched, they're in this string of satellites yes. uh, as they ascend to their orbital height and disperse to their orbital shells. Um, uh, so they were still in that process. In other words, at a fairly low altitude, around about 200 kilometers, when this mm. geomagnetic storm hit. Now, it's not the geomagnetic storm itself that 
um, kills the spacecraft. It's the fact that it fluffs, uh, that the storm fluffs up the atmosphere. It causes the atmosphere to warm and oh. atmospheric density to increase. Uh, and in fact, um, the, you know, the, the, the um, sensors on the spacecraft uh, and the telemetry from those spacecraft showed that the atmospheric drag increased by up to 50% more than it had been before. Um, and that uh, was a serious problem. So uh, what the Starlink team did was put the spacecraft into a safe mode. So they're flying sort of edge on to minimize drag. Um, yep. But the, the net result is this uh, of this is that up to 40 of the satellites didn't make it. They either will re-enter or, or have already re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. And of course, with zero risk, uh, these things, well, they weigh a quarter of a ton. They're not small, but they're mm. certainly small enough to burn up completely in the atmosphere. Um, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, actually, and um, my quote from SpaceX's website on this, it says, this unique situation demonstrates the great lengths the Starlink team has gone to to ensure the system is on the leading edge of on-orbit debris migra mitigation. In other words, mm. they, they haven't left any bits behind. It's, uh, it's a, they, they will all have re-entered. So um, uh, unexpected, perhaps. Um, you know, it's uh, something that we, I, I wouldn't have foreseen, but uh, when you're launching so many satellites, uh, then this kind of thing is bound to take place from time to time. Yeah, it, it was going to happen at some stage, or something was going to happen. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, yeah, to lose forty in one go, though, that's uh, uh, that's pretty expensive. It's isn't expensive it? stuff. I mean, fortunately, the company has deep pockets, but mm. and uh, you've only to look at what's happening with their Starliner project. Um, uh, that, that, by the way, just throwing in an aside, SpaceX is hoping to to have the first orbital launch of its Starliner, um, I think within a month. So you and I might be talking about that down the track. That's going to be yeah, really wow. spectacular. Incredible. Mm. While we're still into things not going quite right, uh, although this is not quite the same, um, a rocket body is about to hit the moon. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Now, I can't remember whether we spoke about this last we time. Did, we did yeah. mention it because there was a project, uh, a project um, uh, asking Astro, uh, yes, uh, right. astronomers to take photos of the moon around the time that this was supposed to happen so that it were, yes, you know, it, they might be able to find it. Yeah, it was, that's right. It was to, to get image, it was actually to get images uh, when the object flew closest to the Earth uh, yeah. to, to give a better calculation of its orbit. So you'd be able to work out from that where it was going to wind up on the far side of the moon. And yeah. um, I think that work has continued. Um, but there's been a rethink because um, everybody was cheerfully blaming Elon Musk um, uh, because it was thought that this was a Falcon 9 body from uh, a launch, actually a launch, of, I think, of a, of a solar uh, uh, research spacecraft. Um, yes, it, oh, in fact, it was the Discover uh, uh, spacecraft launch vehicle discovers a um, uh, it's an, an interesting spacecraft that sits at the L2 point and looks back at the Earth. Uh, that's the L2 point is between the Earth and the Sun, as you know. Um, yeah. No, it's not. That's the L1 point. Sorry, <laughs> L2 is on the other side. Ta -da! That's right. <laughs> anyway, notwithstanding that, um, this was uh, it's a rocket body, um, and that uh, that launch was some years ago, uh, but. Um, Further calculations have been done, and it's now thought not to be a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket body, but uh, one of the remnants of the launch of China's Chang'e 5, uh -huh. uh, which was launched on October the 23rd, 2014. Um, and it was actually a test run for, for uh, future launches. Chang'e is the, is the um, Chinese uh, lunar exploration project, and, uh, you know, we've We've got the uh, the U two two rover on the moon on the far side of the moon at the moment, yeah. Um, so that's yes. Yeah, so it's now thought to be uh, the Chang'e five. In fact, it's called Chang'e five T one uh, body that, um, uh, or the the launch vehicle itself that, that launched that spacecraft. Um, mm. Just a, a footnote there that the you know the fact that it's going to uh, that the this rocket is going to hit the far side of the moon. It would be very unfortunate if it hit 
if it hit the the site of the U2 rover on the far side of the moon, but it's thought that it will actually be, uh, U2 is right down near the southern pole of the moon on the far side. This impact is expected to take place more or less in the middle of the moon's disk. Yeah, uh, it would be terrible luck, but the odds <laughs> wouldn't the odds it? Of, <laughs> it's a bit like the meeting target would be would be pretty remote, but. I mean, it would be the same sort of thing as the um, as the lens cap falling off the Venus probe uh, onto the onto the bit that you're trying to photograph. Uh, yes, to one of the it uh, Soviet Venera probes back <laughs> yeah. in the 80s. Yeah, it, it melted, didn't it? Uh, yes, I think most of it melted. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was just plain bad luck. But you could you could never predict it. It was just I, I, I think an oversight of the conditions, but. What can you do? Hmm. All right. Uh, so that's um, that's due to happen when? Uh, well, the last date I remember is March the 4th. It may have changed, but that's um, we'll know perhaps more accurately nearer the time, but I think March okay. the 4th. So, so if you're a backyard astronomer, get out there and do some happy snapping and see if you can um, get some pictures of it as it gets in there. Uh, well, know. you won't because it's on the far side of the moon. <laughs> well, I... it, no, by that time... Andrew, it's um, it's beyond the reach of amateur uh, telescopes. It, right. was, it was, yeah. I think they wanted the photos sometime around. Yeah, that's right. A couple of, that's exactly right. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I remember now. Ah, yeah, I remember. Now, while we're talking telescopes, which we weren't, but we are now. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> oh, the James Webb Space Telescope has snapped its first image. What did it take a photo of? Oh, well, uh, it, uh, a star, a nice bright star, um, which is uh, one that was chosen. It rejoices in the name of HD 84406. Uh, it's in the co Northern Hemisphere constellation of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Um, but, uh, and so it's, it's a bright star, um, but what, um, what led the NASA mission team to choose this star is it's fairly isolated. Uh, in that part of the sky, it's, you know, you're a long way from the Milky Way. Uh, and so it's an isolated bright star. And what they wanted to do was, uh, why did they want it isolated? Because they're going to take multiple images of this. Um, each of the 18 mirror segments makes its own image because they're not yet aligned. Uh -huh. uh, so what you get is 18 images of this star on the detector. And what right. the last thing you'd want would be half a dozen other stars in the same field of view uh, that are confusing what it is you're looking at. Oh, now I understand what I'm looking at. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, th that picture, Webb's uh, first star image, uh, which I think has been widely uh, circulated, has 18 little white dots on it. And each of those is one separate image of uh, HD, whatever it was, that star, HD, HD 84406. Um, and so uh, the work that will now begin uh, is in aligning the mirror segments so that you end up with them simply forming one image. And that will be, you know, something to look forward to because then we'll start seeing real pictures from the web. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they're going through the, the protocols to get the whole thing lined up and ready to do what it was designed to do, which is the most exciting part. But uh, still some work to be done. Uh, the HD 84406. I used to work for a radio station called HD. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, in Newcastle, 2 HD. It was out of this world. Do you know? Oh, yes, it would have been. What did the HD stand for? Do you know? Uh, it did. Oh, now, um, I think it's the, were the initials of its founder, yeah, if I remember rightly. what I thought they might be. Mm. Well, maybe it could be the same because this HD... It means that this star is in the Henry Draper catalogue of stars. Oh, That's there you go. Of course, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we've spoken about Henry Draper a few times. Indeed. Mm. All right. So, uh, yes, all systems go uh, still at this stage for the James Webb Space Telescope, and we uh, wait with bated breath for it to get down to business and answer all the questions that you ask us all the time that we can't answer for you. <laughs> yeah, and until the web tells us what the answers are. That's right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Indeed, all right. indeed. This is Space Nuts. You're with Andrew Dunkley and, of course, Fred Watson. We're here also. Space Nuts. Now, as I've mentioned many times, we are on social media, so if you'd like to... Uh, become a, a follower of, of Space Nuts on Facebook. We've got an official Space Nuts page there. We've got an official Instagram page. We're on Twitter. 
Uh, we also have a Space Nuts uh, podcast group where everybody can talk to each other about uh, Space Nuts and other things that are happening in astronomy. Um, people often ask each other questions or they throw a question out there and everybody has a crack at answering it. Uh, it's really good fun. It's a great group of people and uh, you're more than welcome to join it. Uh, and that's the Space Nuts podcast group. But, um, whatever form of social media that you use, if you do use it, you will find Space Nuts there. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we encourage you to, uh, to, to join us. Now, um, Fred, uh, I, I was going to get straight into this next subject, but um, I, I thought I'd bring up a, a, a little bit of uh, a personal thing because we, in our recent trip, were in Melbourne and we went to a place called uh, Science Works, which is uh, a facility aimed primarily at kids, but I'm a kid at heart. So I, I wanted to go and have a look at this place. And it's, it, it, it looks at all sorts of science um, issues from food right through to uh, artificial intelligence to you name it, it's covered in science and astronomy. Uh, and they've got the Melbourne Planet Planetarium there, which is a fantastic facility because um, one of the things that we looked at while we were watching the show in the planetarium was Proxima Centauri. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but the other thing I stumbled across quite accidentally because I'm a bit of a sticky beak and I went down into the bowels of this facility and I found a telescope and realised that they were res uh, restoring the Melbourne telescope. And I sent you a photo of it. And you wrote back and said, oh, yes, I know all that. I'm the patron of that. Um, so tell us tell us a bit about what's going on. Well, yeah. Oh, look, this is a marvellous story, Andrew. This uh, we, we don't have time to give it justice here, but this telescope was built uh, in 1869 uh, by the British firm of Howard Grubb. And that's the company that I began my career with. Uh, oh, wow. Just about 100 years later, I think. Yes, in fact, just about 100 years later. Uh, so I've got a very close connection with the company that built it. Um, it came to uh, Australia, uh, was part of Melbourne Observatory. It was the biggest fully steerable telescope in the world uh, for a long time. It has a 48 inch diameter mirror, which was made of metal. It didn't live up to all its expectations. And in the early 20th century, it fell out of use. Um, and eventually, in 1944, I think, the Melbourne Observatory was closed as a research institution. And Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra bought the telescope for scrap. Um, but they didn't scrap it. They refurbished it uh, using some of the components uh, and gave it a completely new lease of life. It is. Uh, it worked for best part, well, it was best part of, no, more like 45 years, something like that, mm. was refurbished twice. One of the things it did was demonstrate that um, dark matter can't be lots of black holes and things of that sort. Uh, it's got to be some subatomic particle. Did lots of things. Then uh, it's 2003, I uh, think the, can't remember the date. It was around, it was certainly January. Uh, the, the observatory burned down in the bushfire oh. of uh, January, 2003. The telescope, yeah. effectively a lot of it melted, believe it or not, it was, the dome uh, melted aluminium onto the telescope structure. Uh, the more modern part of it was damaged much more. Um, I wrote about it in my book, Stargazer, The Life and Times of the Telescope, which was published not long after that, and said, mm. you know, this is never going to be recovered. It might end up in a museum. And then uh, in 2008, this gang of people got together and said, we can refurbish this. We can fix it. And that's what's happening. Uh, it's a combination let me get it right. Uh, it's a while since I thought about this. It's Museums Victoria, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, and I think the Bureau of Meteorology is involved as well. So um, fabulous project. Um, the reason I'm its patron, I guess, is partly because, well, let me tell you, when I was a, a youngster, I was still at school, I had a book from the library by Henry King called The History of the Telescope. And it had a picture of this marvellous looking, fantastic machine in Melbourne. And I said to myself, I want to use that. It's my favourite telescope and it has been ever since. So I might uh, I might get Hugh to put the photo I took of the Melbourne yeah. telescope on our uh, on our cover page for the podcast. Yeah, because uh, it's a it's a beautiful telescope. It is. It's just it, lovely. It, it's stunning. Um, it's mm. it, it's uh, 
Yeah, it, it, it was it was pristine mid 19th century engineering. Unfortunately, some of the technology was out of date. Mechanically, it wasn't, but the yeah. optics were, and that is what conspired to its its demise. But it, you know, it's got this new lease of life. The idea is it'll be in a science centre in Melbourne, and people will actually be able to look through it. Yeah, I, gee, I, you know, I nearly didn't see it. I was just yeah. walking along, and we were about to come up a set of stairs, and I. I saw a sign and I, I walked past it and it must have taken 10 or 15 seconds for my brain to go, go back, Andrew, go great. back. You, <laughs> I, I subliminally read the sign and I went back and I said to Judy, hang on a sec. Yep. And I rushed back down the stairs and went through into this the, workshop. A little, yes, that's right. They've got a, a, a viewing gallery in the, the yeah. workshop. I was there actually in 2019 when this all happened. I did a little keynote presentation on it, which it's I was worth very going, excited to worth do. going along just to see that. If you're in Melbourne, yeah, the um, yeah. Science Works facilities at Spotswood, it's an easy train journey from central Melbourne uh, and, and just a great facility. And if you've got kids, they will love it. They will absolutely love it. It's a terrific place. Lovely people too, they even are. though they paid me out for not talking <laughs> enough, which is very, very rare indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great now, stuff. Um, to the subject of this segment, and um, you know, obviously, uh, telescopes have a lot to do with this, and, and so do planetariums, because that's how we uh, uh, got onto this subject in the first place. Because I was looking at Proxima Centauri and the Melbourne um, Planetarium. Uh, but the news that's uh, out now is that a third Earth-like planet has been found orbiting Proxima Centauri, uh, which is very exciting uh, because it's the closest to us. That's right. It's the closest star to our solar system. Uh, and this it, it, it is uh, an exciting discovery. Uh, there's a nice quote, actually, from um, one of the astronomers who discovered the first planet back in 2016 uh, orbiting Proxima Centauri, uh, a scientist by the name of Guillem Anglada Escudé, who is at the Institute of Space Sciences in Barcelona. And he said, this is showing that the nearest star probably has a very rich planetary system. Because if you find three uh, planets orbiting this dwarf star, which is what it is, um, there's a good chance there are more smaller objects. Mm. Um, and in fact, the newly discovered uh, planet, and it's, um, it, it's actually uh, astronomers, I think, from Portugal, is that right? Uh, yes, University of uh, Porto in Portugal. Uh, they use the Very Large Telescope, uh, which is kind of at the other end of, of the scale from the Great Melbourne Telescope that you went to see. Um, this is for 8.2 metre telescopes at Cerro Paranal in Chile. And one of them has an instrument, I love its name, it's called Espresso. <laughs> and it makes you think of coffee. Uh, okay. And it's an acronym for, wait for it, Andrew, a shell spectrograph for rocky exoplanets and stable spectroscopic observations. There you are. I love it. Uh, yeah, Espresso is a fantastic instrument for discovering planets by the Doppler wobble technique, you know, in which you look for the motion of the parent star as it's pulled out of place slightly by the, by the motion of the planet. So what have they found? Uh, well, an object by the name of Proxima Centauri D, uh, so B, C, and D are the are the three planets that we now know. Uh, it's it is actually a sub Earth. It's not so much a uh, an Earth like planet. I've got a feeling it's something like twenty five percent of the mass of the Earth. Is that right? Right. Yeah. It's 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 it's, it's a sub Earth rather than a uh, an Earth sized planet. Um, it <laughs> it orbits its parent star every five days <laughs> so it's whizzing oh. around and of course that's because um proxima is a dwarf star so its planets are much closer in uh, because its gravity is less than the sun much closer in than the planets of our solar system uh, and um this one as i said it, it's it's actually only um about 0 0.03 three percent of the distance that we are from the sun uh, and it takes it five days to go around yeah, um, I think they've referred to it as a provisional planet. They haven't actually yes, that's given it right. planet status yet. It's still got, uh, it, it's still got, uh, you know, the, the candidate status. Now, mm. um, Proxima B, which is the, uh, I think the first one that was discovered, is actually 
within Proxima Centauri's habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone. So that could have liquid water on its surface. Um, uh, it's, that goes around the star once in 11 days, so it's, it's further out. Um, the problem with Proxima is it's a red dwarf star. So, you know, even though you might have liquid water on one of the worlds, there are, there are these flares that, um, it, you know, that makes our, the flares that our sun ch uh, spits out look pretty, pretty tame. Uh, right. And they're very high energy uh, events, which could fry anything that's trying to, trying to grow uh, on Proxima Centauri B. So the, and the, you know, the other end of the scale. Uh, so that's the two pla uh, planets that, um, that's B and D, which we just discussed, which are within, you know, a few million kilometers of the, uh, of the, of the star. But the, the other one, Proxima Centauri C, is actually 50% further away from Proxima Centauri than we are from the sun. So it's oh. 220 million kilometers and goes round every every 1900 days yeah you know so roughly every six oh sorry so every five years every 5.2 yeah. years so it's it's at the other extreme yeah it, it's yeah. probably a very cold world is it uh yeah it will be because proxima is is a dim star and it's mm. sitting there at the distance mars is from the sun so yeah not much not much heat going out to proxima centauri c yeah well Ma mars is pretty darn cold isn't it it is yeah and that's with a sun-like star so yeah. Um, but yeah a very interesting comment from uh, uh, dr angelada escude who about you know it's probably got this really very rich planetary system so you can bet your life there's going to be more discoveries and i bet it's not very long before the james webb telescope points in that direction oh yeah we've we've got to have it peak at our nearest neighbours for sure. Indeed. Mm. All right. Um, so that's uh, a bit of exciting news, although it doesn't sound like this latest uh, planet is uh, at all habitable and may not be able to sustain any life given its um, distance from uh, that red dwarf, but uh, an exciting discovery nonetheless. Very much so. This is the Space Nuts podcast, also uh, a radio show heard on the community radio network around Australia with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.